let's bring it all back. We've had a, a, a tremendous uh, overview of global biodiversity issues. Down the road, maybe half a kilometre, you'll see the, the River Nore. The River Nore has, has been flowing through the landscape for millennia, providing goods and services. It's also one of the most special salmon rivers in Ireland. It, um, it's, it, it, it's, it's famous among the ang angling community in, in providing absolutely bounty of salmon for people to, to, to fish. But something has happened dramatically in the last number of decades. The number of salmon that have been flowing and spawning in the river have declined absolutely dramatically. This is a shocking statistic. This has been a, a, a fact that has been replicated around the rivers on the island of Ireland. Not only has my generation in this location robbed, um, you know, we, we've behaved dreadfully in terms of morally and ethically, but even if you want to take a pragmatic view of it, we're robbing the future generation of the goods, ecosystems, goods and services that are being provided in our own vicinity. This is the reason why we need to manage data and why we need to put structures in place to try to change that. So that basically is the message that I want to try to get across. We know in Ireland, and it's been con it, it was done conservatively because it was done by the department, they've estimated that <laughs> the biodiversity contributes two point, at least 2.6 billion to the Irish economy uh, annually. But actually, we have an inability to answer basic questions on what biodiversity do we have, how is it distributed, and how is it changing? For a large sector, if there was any other sector of the society that was contributing so much, it would be absolutely viewed as shocking that this was such a kind of a blind policy area, public policy area. A consequence of us not being able to answer these questions really is that we don't make it easy for politicians to provide public policy for us. The data centre was established 11 years ago, and I just want to, we did a kind of an overview of the sector as it was in Ireland at the time. We identified the problems that we needed to address. There was a lack of data and information. There's a lack of coordination, a lack of information management systems. There was poor sectoral capacity and the lack of public awareness. So from our perspective, we basically set the challenge, not just us, but with our partners, that we had to, 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 to deal with these things in terms of strengthening our knowledge base, providing coordination and leadership, build fit-for-purpose informatics infrastructure, build capacity across the recording community, and raise awareness of biodiversity. So this is the concepts that we arrived into, and this is a challenge we set ourselves and to try to provide leadership with our partner. And I know Kieran at the start mentioned that we are, the data center is mentioned as a, number of, uh, as a partner in a number of specific actions within the National Biodiversity Plan. But I would argue what we're trying to do is we provide the tools and the structures to make it easy to actually try to mainstream biodiversity within Irish society, which is the overall ambition of the National Biodiversity Plan. And of course, we're, act, we're listed as a number of act, actors within the plan, but I would argue that we're actually trying to provide the tools and the infrastructure and the services to actually allow us to like, underpin the National Biodiversity Plan and all the actions within it. What I'd like to do is give you an overview of the infrastructure that we put in place. I think a lot of you are familiar with specific aspects of the work we do, but perhaps what you're not familiar is about the overall structure and how we operate it, the infrastructure and what we're trying to achieve. So I've kind of two, two, uh, two um, uh, tasks today. I want to try to introduce you to how we're structured, and then I want to give you a few examples of how what we do feeds into direct policy applications and outputs so that you can, you can view. And we've invited a number of our partners that actually have data and perhaps more importantly have uh, funding opportunities. Now, to be churlish of me to stand here and actually identify your names having invited you for a free lunch, but I would say to our partners who are sitting around here is please Look at what I'm showing you. See how you can build on this infrastructure. It's a shared service. It's a national infrastructure to help your needs and that we can work together to actually try to change biodiversity loss. So please 
concentrate and see how you can, you can work us, with us in future. And I'll give you my phone number afterwards. Okay, so essentially, the, we, have a we have seven strategic objectives in terms of our work program, which over, um, puts the framework for what we do. We're trying to obviously mobilize data. That's the key work we do. It's absolutely important that we try to attract change in biodiversity in the Irish countryside. And the idea, the information has to be in a format that it can inform decision making. We develop strategic partnerships. We're a very small team, and we have to work in par partnerships to, um, to benefit from each other. Of course, biodiversity is uh, a global and an international uh, theme, so we have to work not only the island of Ireland, but Europe and, be and beyond, hence GVIP being here. If we don't communicate the value of biodiversity, we're not going to win anyone over to it. And, and finally, we do a lot of work with citizen science, but not just maybe scientists working in a voluntary capacity. And we want to strengthen the recorder base that we can generate more data and also better quality data. And on the left-hand side is a, a schematic diagram to show you the, the data and information cycle. And it's important that it's, it's seen as a cycle. We've developed nine different kind of software applications which allow us to deliver our strategic objectives. These are tools that enable us to manage data and information and make it available. Now, you don't need to look at that in detail, but I just do want to show you that there's, there's nine components that feel, feel into a central wheel. And we're talking about a cycle that moves from management of data into publishing data, through to coordinating data, and then finally to reporting at the national level and local level. And clearly, the priorities or the outputs from the reporting should feed back into setting priorities for collecting data and managing again. So it's a cumulative thing. You feel that everything is feel, feeding into a central axis, and any work that we do um, benefits and builds on existing work. So just I'll run through this. I have to put on my glasses. Apologies. So we have we've built obviously the national biodiversity database, and we have a record management system which feeds into the management, provides tools to manage the data. Then through biodiversity maps and then feeding data into GBIF node and the species profile systems, these are our applications that allow us to publish empirical data, but also information. We have developed a national sampling framework and we have uh, presented a biodiversity in, in, uh, inventory to show you the state of knowledge in Ireland's biodiversity. And these are very useful overviews, perhaps, and structures to allow us to, to better coordinate data, that we can be more efficient in data collection and we're collecting data to a better quality. Uh, Tomás will, will, will say quite a lot about this in the next session. And then we have a biodiversity actions reporting system. There's a lot of infer interventions happening on the ground. Una will be talking about a lot of those. People are doing a lot of work for biodiversity. Even national parks and wildlife are doing an awful lot of good uh, positive management work. What we have a facility is to bring these together and show the cumulative impact of the work that's happening on the ground as part of reporting. And again, Deirdre has also mentioned the National Biodiversity Indicators, the aggregate of, the, of, of information to try to feed into national policy. So this is basically the format and the, 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 the overview of the infrastructure that we've built, which we believe is reasonably fit for purpose for what we want to try to achieve. And again, we've mentioned that we're quite fortunate in that we're working with Compass Inform for in <laughs> we're working for Compass Informatics. Sorry, Garod, <laughs> but that it's uh, the delivery of the services through a, a, a five-year service level agreement. But it does mean that we bring a kind of a, a public, se a private sector ethos to the to the work, and through the uh, expertise. Uh, and skill set that, that uh, Compass Informatics provide, we can, we can ad use the best available technology so that what we're delivering really is fit for purpose and it's cutting edge, edge technology. So then, in terms of a consequence, when we began in 2008, when the first um, portal was developed, we had um, mobilized, or there were in the database, we just over 200,000 records of short of 2,000 species. And then the, the National Authority, which is National Parks and Wildlife, who were doing the red list, there was very few red lists done. There was less than, less than half a percent of the species that we have in Ireland were assessed for their, for their threat status. There was very few red lists done. It meant that the majority of um, the species were not assessed for what threat they were posed. 
Now, not just because of us, but working with our partners means that in 2017 and 18, we're now in the situation where there's in excess of 4 million data points uh, mobilized. And we have some data, only some data, for about 16,000 species. It means that we've been able to provide services to national parks and wildlife when they do the red list that the data can feed directly from citizen scientists and from other sources and make it available to national parks and wildlife. So that we're now in a situation where about 10% of the species we have in Ireland are threatened, are, are, uh, have, been, have been assessed. And this is an overview really of, the, of the, the results of that red list process. It's not nice to look at about a quarter on average, about a quarter or one fifth of the species that have been assessed are threatened with extinction across different taxonomic groups. We've, we've, we've heard that's a similar story from other, uh, other countries we've heard. So this basically then is a, a, a spatial overview of the data points that we have in the National Biodiversity Data, uh, Database. Unsurprising, the majority of the data relate to the terrestrial, to the landmass of Ireland. But you do see that there's quite a bit of data beginning to be built up for the marine as well. And this is the territorial area that uh, we have a, a remit over. So the, the landmass is only, I think, one-tenth of the total marine area. So there's still huge data gaps, particularly once you go for the further up from shore you go. What I want to do now is to give you an idea of our data flow that we operate and to give you some, show some of the, the ways in which we've taken those data points and changed them into kind of data products or outputs that will actually feed into policy and into terms of engagement, etc. And again, I just want to give you an overview of the types of, of, of process that we operate. I suppose the key element to what we do and that most of you would be familiar with is our data and mapping portal called Biodiversity Maps. Actually, I just, sorry, I'm, I'm just jumping ahead of myself. The overall structure of our, our informatics and the data flow is based on having two separate databases. On the left, we have a database which holds all our unvalidated data from wherever it comes, from recorders, it's captured from mobile phone apps, and we have a firewall there that only validated data has to, that passes through will go into our validated database. So no matter how much data we collect from citizen scientists and from other source, sources, only the data that's undergone validation will be fed back out for its use. So that if we, we obviously have an objective, we want our data to be used in terms of planning. Uh, for those kind of hard uh, decision making, we have to make sure that the data is high quality as possible. So we have a dual system in operation and we have a firewall between the two and that's absolutely essential for, for us in terms of delivering high quality data. I've mentioned biodiversity maps, that's the kind of public facing um, interface of the work that we do uh, in terms of the, 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 um, the database. I just want to, this is what it looks like. So we've provided a facility to drill down through the data set based on taxonomic group, or we've also tagged species that are policy relevant. So any protected species, threatened species or invasive species are tagged, and we can, if you're only interested in those one, you can drill right down to the database very quickly. What I want to show you now for the next minute or two is I just want to give you a, f a feel for the, how the system operates and how you can use it as a tool to interrogate. Um, for each of the 16,000 species, this is the kind of information that's presented once you choose the species. Basically a distributional map showing all the data in the system, either at 10 kilometer or we have a marine map as well, and something about the, the, the taxonomy and something about the data resource that's in the database. And then there's a, a temporal spread of the records both on a year, sorry, within the year and across years. This is the example of a red squirrel, which is uh, one of our most iconic species. The mapping system is like any other GIS mapping system really in that you can, in, the data are added as points or layers and you can, in, it's a common platform so you can interrogate the data together. So this is a distribution at the national scale of red squirrel on the island of Ireland. You can drill down and view the, the distribution points against different backgrounds. You can go right down to the aerial photograph level and each single individual record, you can query the details of it. So you'll find out who recorded it, what date, what data set it is and any associated variables. And what's very important is that we have the data set listed here and if you want to use these data, you can go back to the metadata, find out about that uh, survey and see if it's fit for purpose for your use. 
You can start building up a picture of how it might, why, why the, the distribution is as it is and what might be the reason. This, for example, shows that there uh, seems to be a correspondence between the distribution of red squirrel and ancient and long established woodland. So that's beginning to give us some cue to, to what's the factors behind its, its, its distribution in this part of Kilkenny. You can also do some coincidence mapping. Red squirrel, by the way, is good. Gray squirrel is bad, okay, in Ireland, just so you know. So if you want to try to see plot uh, coincidence mapping, see if there's a correspondence between red squirrel and, and gray squirrel. You can see here there's uh, the magenta and the orange, sorry, the yellow and the orange are showing where they overlap. So the gray squirrel distribution, it has crossed the River Nore at Inish Teague, and it's now in this, in this wonderful woodland where red squirrels are quite abundant. If we want to try to do something about that, we need some instruments. We need some policy instruments or we need some structures to be able to say, well, how can we try to address this, this, this question, this conservation question? So switching on, see, is there protected areas in the area? There is, the River Nore is protected, but not for woodland. It's not for the red, red squirrel or gray squirrel, so there's no relevance there. But when we look, for example, to see what plots of land have, have, have um, had forestry pre premiums paid for them that are effectively managed because of state premiums, we see that there's a very strong overlap between, between that policy instrument, for example, and the distribution of these, of, of these mammals. Now, I'm not saying that that makes any logical sense in terms of a policy response, but what it does show you is that you have a tool here that can start answering these questions and perhaps saying, ah, oh, well, you know, this is, this is perhaps a, a solution to, or one of the solutions that we should, we should adopt. I can't stress enough that we've put a lot of investment, National Parks and Wildlife and the Heritage Council have put a lot of investment in developing uh, this infrastructure and we have a clear data flow that everyone can use. And it's presented by way of a shared service to our partners. Any reputable body that's got data and wants to avail of this, they can use this. So, I just want to show you that um, we've been quite good, I think, in terms of um, offering the service to our partners who's used this uh, data flow as a way to publish data. And this is a list of, this is the, this is the list of the data, data sets that we have on our system. And the, they come from a lot of different sources. We have 144 different, source, uh, different data sets. And I suppose the key message is that if you see on the right-hand side that one of the columns there is license, we publish license under two licenses. One is CCBY, so anyone who publishes data to us through CCBY, the data are freely available to download, and they're also uploaded to the GBIF data portal. That is actually what we want most people to, to, to license us to publish it in that way. It means it's freely available, and it's for others to use in terms of research and the like. But we do provide an opportunity where people can publish the data to us under a restricted license, and what it means is that you can, we can map their data with all the other data on this common platform. So it's clear that it's there. We can begin to see, use the data to help us understand distribution, um, distributions at the national level. But you can't download the data. If you want to use the data in terms of a data download, you have to go back to the data provider. What it does mean is that this mapping system effectively serves as a shop window to profile the existing data that's there for biodiversity. So at least as a starting point, we know what the total kind of data resource for the country is there. And these are a list of the kind of sectors that um, are bodies that have provided data and map it through or publish it through biodiversity maps. You see, we have a lot of statutory bodies, we have NGOs, the research community, the outputs of some of their research projects are published through this. And what's very interesting really is that we've got a lot of British-based organizations who provide data to us to publish through biodiversity maps. And that's actually a very important, um, a significant uh, service perhaps, because although traditionally there's an awful lot of data available for Britain and Ireland in data portals, if it isn't prov provided to us, it's not available for Irish decision making. And that's a very, very important thing. That's the reason we want to repatriate as much data as possible uh, and get into the system. And, and because of the long, rich tradition of kind of British-based um, societies collecting data, Britain and Ireland, getting some of those data back to Ireland will, will really benefit the long-term conservation, I think. 
Okay, so this again, just to, to what I want to talk to you now about, I suppose, the data in. We do a lot of work in trying to um, encourage people out and about to submit data. So any sightings that's made is a value. Now, it may not be as, as, as valuable as quanti proper, quantitative systematic data, but as we're going about our, our daily life, we see things, and we've made it quite easy to provide uh, uh, structures so that we can capture those data feeding into the unvalidated database. So thanks to um, a lot of prompting from Nor uh, Norway, we've developed a data portal that looks like this. It summarizes the data that have been submitted, and we've 90,000 observations have been submitted that since the start of the year. For a small island, we, we think that's a really, intense, a really impressive recording um, effort. And we, we make it easy that, depending on what taxonomic group you're interested, you can click on these icons and you get the, the, the Irish checklist for that group, and you can submit a record. You can plot it on a map, um, and then we have a mobile phone app. So th this, this, this is a very easy way to capture casual sightings. And the, the data portal allows you to have, with, if you put in your own email address, you effectively have your own personalized record management system. It'll map your own data so that you always retain the visibility of that and you can download the data. Essentially, it's, it's a dig digitization tool for, for rec um, records. We've put an awful lot of effort into actually not only capturing the data, but trying to engage with people and use it as, uh, there's not a huge amount, as you would have, um, our international guests, as you'd have judged from some of the discussions this morning, there's not, there's a perception perhaps that there's not a huge amount of support lo um, politically for biodiversity. So we're trying to build um, awareness and engagement to sh demonstrate to policymakers that actually there is a lot of interest in terms of biodiversity. So we, we've round, over in excess of 200 training workshops, and we've trained 3,000 people since 2009 in terms of various aspects of, of, of biodiversity recording to build capacity within the structure, uh, within the, 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 the sector. And you can see in this graph, there's, it's really showing tangible benefits. You can see the trajectory is upwards. This is a, a graph showing you recording activity. So we've almost 8,000 individual recorders actively recording in the countryside. For us, we're impressed by that. We think that's actually a good, a good news story. And there is a lot of people out there who are genuinely interested in, in conservation. One of the, well, the objective of us being here is to piggyback on the back of, of the, the GBIF meeting that was held in Kilkenny for the last two days. We're really delighted that we're in a position that we can publish open data into GBIF so that Irish data, if I record a, a newt in my garden, that I can submit the data, and I know that it makes its way to this global portal where some of Jeff's cheetahs and elephants are in the same database. It's really exciting, it's wonderful, and it's a very direct link that we can begin to build up a big data resource of, of, of the global biodiversity. And as I think Donald has already shown, that within that portal, within GBIF, what it does, it brings the Irish data together with international data or data from international organizations and countries, and it gives you an overview of all the data that's available for the island of Ireland um, so that you get a good overall picture and you can get the contextual, uh, you can get Ireland in a contextual position. And there's a whole, they have these uh, national reports and there's a whole series of dynamic um, reports which show you the activity on the portal in terms of downloads of data. And there are quite a few downloads of data uh, about Ireland. So we know that, that those data are actually feeding their way into, into research. And there's a number of, it also generates results of any of the uh, Irish-based researchers who are authors in, in papers that are published that use uh, uh, GBIF-mediated data. So this is a wonderful tool for us to see how Irish data is being used at a global research uh, context. Yeah, I don't want to t say too much more about this, but because we have a common platform and we have the technologies built up, we have the capacity to build and to, to feed data through APIs into different um, specific use cases. Um, for example, um, I, I'll talk about it in a moment, but we, we have, we're able to produce alerts, for example, uh, for any of the species, that the invasive alien species that are on, on a high, high risk species. So, there's poor individuals around the country that if, if we get a record, record of one of those species 
um, found in Ireland within, the the, within a matter of a few minutes, they get alert, an alert on their mobile phone to say species X has, has arrived in Ireland. So that, that's a catalyst then for action and in, uh, mobilizing. So we have a system where we can feed these services out to partners it, uh, to meet some of their needs. Oops, I'm going backwards. Okay, I suppose the final thing I want to just talk about is that, okay, this is, this is the kind of architecture, I suppose, for the data flows. But for me, I'm not interested in technology. What I'm interested about, how can we use these data to affect change? That really, for me, is what it's all about. And we're, because we have data validated and we have this system in place, we're able to make those data available for different uses. I've already mentioned the use, the direct use case. Any data that's submitted to us goes is available for red listing processes. That's a very immediate and direct use that people can, if they're out there collecting data, they can, their data is of direct value. Another immediate kind of direct route, I suppose, for people's records to be uh, considered in policy making is that we have an ability on the system for any designated site. You can choose what site you're interested in and you get a list of a report basically giving you a list of all the species that are in our database that have been recorded within that designated, it could be a designated site, or it could be in a parcel of land that's earmarked for development, or in fact it could be your own farmland. And this is the format of the, of the data output. It shows you the feature name, um, the species group, the species name, the number of records that are in our database for that species, the date of the last record, which is important, was it recorded there recently or not, uh, the title of the data set from where it came, but importantly, we've tagged the data so there's designations. If I'm doing an EIS, for example, I can do a polygon search, generate this report, and I get a list of the species that I know that have been recorded here previously that perhaps could be threatened or could be protected. And all we're trying to do here is to send a queue to the uh, local authorities to say, you need to do a proper a survey for this species because in the past it's been recorded here. So we're not trying to provide a data dump to our local authorities, but we're providing them with a quick uh, shortcut to circum that we should be able to flag that species have been here and you need to go off and do a proper assessment. And this is a, an Excel spreadsheet that can be attached to any report you want to do. A small bit was already mentioned about invasive alien species. I have to say thanks to the, the funding from the department, we have a, a very good work program developed around invasive species and there's obviously a very strong need for us to mobilize data as Eugenio has shown in terms of invasive alien species feeding into the commission. The one thing, not to, to try to um, repeat what Eugenio said, up in that Top left-hand corner is a kind of a, a, a graphic of our involvement. And I just want to say there's three elements to what we can do, let's say thematically, around data sets, groups of data about a thematic area. We've already mentioned that through biodiversity maps, the empirical data that's collected, collated, validated, actually can feed to GBIF and into easing. So we're able to mobilize empirical data. We also, because of the common platform, we're able to mobilize information. So experts can actually use the data and other, uh, other things to do things like risk assessment, um, horizon scanning, and just autological information about species that occur in, far, in Ireland. So not only are we mobilizing the empirical data, we're mobilizing information to make sense of that. But what's actually very important that it's often overlooked, thanks to the funding from National Parks and Wildlife, we actually have funding for an invasive species officer who works on this full time. I, I don't know actually over the last three days, we talk an awful lot about technology, we talk about data, we talk about infrastructure, uh, in, infrastructural weaknesses and the like. Human resources really haven't very often been flagged. Because we have a staff member working full time on invasive species, we're able to mobilize expertise. And I, again, I'll make a plea, we're, we're, we're a fledging uh, little data center we need more resources available, he, human resources, to actually make these systems work. Um, but this, again, this is an example of a thematic kind of subject area that I think we're making a real difference, and I hope that we're of, 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 of value, real value to the department, and we hope they keep giving us money. And yeah, I'm not going to, to dwell long on the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan, 
This has already been mentioned, and Una's going to talk about it next, but just to say that it, it really has been tremendously successful, and I think the key, there's a lot of very positive things about it, but what, what Una has done uh, is that she's taken kind of the evidence base. Pollinators are really struggling in Ireland, but she said, you know, we have to, we have to do something on the ground, and um, it's a solutions-based kind of uh, plan. It says it, it's put... It's made it accessible to people. Here are the well, here's the problem, here's the solution. It's easy to get involved. Can we support you to do that? And it's probably a bit of a game changer in Ireland in terms of how we address the issue of nature conservation. We're not stressing the negative, we're stressing the positive and the proactive work that can be done. And uh, I think Una will, will, will quite excite you about what work is to be done, or what we're doing here. Just, I know I'm conscious of time. Um, can I just, another area that's really important is that, and Tomás is going to talk about this, so I don't want to steal his thumber, thunder, but what's really important is trying to, I suppose, steer a lot of us who go out casually doing citizen science recording to do it in a small bit more of a structured way so that we can add value to the work that we're doing. Do it systematically uh, in a structured way. So we operate three, um, three recording monitoring schemes and these data, Tomás will talk, but these data are feeding into the Article 17 report for the Marsh Fertillery. The butterflies are providing an indicator of climate change, and the bumblebee monitoring scheme are uh, providing information, in uh, an indicator on pollinator services. As Yona mentioned, I mean, these are the routes that we're actually showing how these will feed into society. These are really important trends, indicators, showing exactly what's happening in the Irish countryside. And this is what they look like. Tomás is probably going to deal with that, so I don't need to go into detail. And again, I think, just to, to, to stress the National Biodiversity Indicators, um, Deirdre has done a really good job of showing the need for these and what we're doing. But again, I think it's important that um, indicators like this need to be produced, I think. I'm going to make a pitch for us here by someone who's seen as quasi-independent, at least. I think it does actually give a lot of integrity to them. And um, I think we have the skill set and we have the capacity to do this kind of work on behalf of the state. And again, just my pitch for the work, I think, you know, the, there are more examples, I think, that we can provide uh, services to the state in a very cost-effective way. And that's a very important message as well. Um, I'm just rounding up. I know, Garod, I'm running over, but um, just to say, through Google Scholar, we're able to track some of the use cases of our data. And things like alien species, you'd expect us to be popping up on the profile. Um, but, and climate change and land use, um, uh, uh, sorry, distribution of bumblebees. But what's quite interesting, we're seeing that um, our data has been used in a, Sli a Sligo urban improvement scheme. Uh, the, and, and things like planning for the rural development program. So there's actually a reach. We begin to show that the data and our services are, have, have an outer reach. Now, everyone is working very hard, and it's hard sometimes to know if you're doing the right work. We're all doing work, but whether we're doing the right work is, is, is obviously uh, something it's not entirely too sure that we can say that. But a couple of months ago, we applied for the best use of data to achieve social impact in an award by the data science community. And we were absolutely thrilled that we were actually successful and we won that award. And this is a photograph of Tomás and Vivian, colleagues, collecting that. So it was really reassuring to us that the kind of community from the technology science sector are saying to us, you know, giving us an encouragement and keep going what we're doing. And, um, and uh, yeah, things like this are really satisfying and, and, and uh, very good for us. And I just... to wind up to say that I started by saying that, you know, we know that biodiversity contributes 2.6 billion to, annually to the Irish economy, but I now think that we're beginning to have a situation where that biodiversity re resource has visibility, that basic, we have a basic information management system in place. We have a vehicle now to show citizen engagement that it's actually important for communities. And we've begun, and only begun, to provide the evidence base so that we can encourage, I think, policy response from government. So thank you.